in section 5.4, we're going to discuss the fundamental theorem of calculus. The fundamental theorem of calculus, part 1, says if f is continuous on a to b, then the function, uh, the antiderivative f of x, equals the, the integral from a to x of f of t dt, has a derivative at every point x in a, b, and the derivative of the integral equals f of x. Now what this is saying is the derivative of the integral from a to x of f of t dt is equal to just f of x. In other words, if you take the integral and then you take the derivative, what they really do is they undo each other. They are inverse operations, just like addition and subtraction, or this is similar to saying uh, the square root of x squared equals x. Those are inverse operations as well. So we're going to apply the fundamental theorem. We're going to find the derivative of the integral of cosine of t dt. <clears throat> so let's do this the long way, and then we'll discuss the, the shorter version. So the antiderivative, let's do the antiderivative first, and then we'll do the derivative. So the antiderivative of cosine of t is sine of t. And we're going to evaluate that from negative pi to x. But when we, after we evaluate it, we're going to take the derivative of all of this. So that's equal to the derivative of the sine of x minus the sine of negative pi. And I don't really even care what the sine of negative pi is because I know that it's a constant. So if we're going to take the derivative of this, it ends up being the cosine of x, and then the derivative of a constant is just zero. So when, what ends up happening is the derivative and the integral, they undo each other so that the answer is just the cosine of t. Now, that's the long way where you actually take the antiderivative and then the derivative. There's no need to do that. Because if we do the exact same thing with this, I mean, this will be the inverse tangent, but then we're going to take the derivative and it'll go right back to this function because that's the point. They undo each other. So the answer to the second one, I'm not going to go through all the steps. It's just 1 over 1 plus x squared. And there's no plus c because uh, we would take the derivative of the constant and it would be 0. So there's the answer to the second one. Now what happens if there's an x squared here instead of an x? Look back at what we had before. It was just x's on top. Well, let's do this the long way and see what happens. So we're going to take the derivative. It says find the derivative of this function. So let's take the antiderivative. And the antiderivative, or the integral, is again sine of t. We're going to evaluate that from 1 to x squared. And then when we're done, we're going to take the derivative of this. But for right now, uh, we are doing the antiderivative. So this is equal to, we'll have yet to take the derivative. We have the sine of x squared minus the sine of 1. Evaluate the top minus evaluate the bottom. So there it is. I don't care what the sine of 1 is. We could grab a calculator and, and find the decimal value, but it's a constant. So the derivative of this is cosine of x squared, but times the derivative of the inside. We've got to remember the chain rule. So it's 2x cosine of x squared, and the derivative of sine of 1 would just be 0. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's the answer. Well, you plug in the value right here, but then you have to remember that when you take the derivative, you'll be using the chain rule. So if we had something like this, integral from 6, the bottom number doesn't really matter, to x to the third of, let's say, tangent of t dt. Well, it doesn't matter. We don't know what the antiderivative of tangent is yet, but it doesn't matter because to do this problem, if we are taking the derivative of the integral, it's the tangent of x to the third. You plug x to the third in for t, but remember, when you take the derivative, if we were taking the derivative of the antiderivative, we would have to remember the chain rule. So there'd be a 3x squared out front. So that's the derivative of the integral of tangent. If the variable is the lower limit, then, well, uh, one of the rules says we can switch these two. And instead of going from x to 5, we can go from 5 to x. So we have 3t sine of t dt. So we just plug in the x for the t's, but we note that this would actually be negative instead of positive.
And there it is. <clears throat> if we construct a function with a given derivative and value, oh, okay, so we're constructing a function with a given derivative and value. Find a function y equals f of x with the derivative that's tangent and satisfies the condition that f of 3 equals 5. Well, we don't know the antiderivative of tangent it is, so we just need to find a function whose derivative is tangent. Well, if we say that y equals the integral from 3 to x of tangent of t dt, then when we take the derivative of this, uh, the value or, or the derivative will be tangent, and we need to set this up so that when we plug 3 in, we need a value of 5. Well, the way I've set it up with 3 in the bottom, if we plug 3 into the top and we evaluate an integral from 3 to 3, that's 0. So plugging in 3 here will give me a value of 0 for this, for the integral. And then if we add on 5, we will meet both conditions because the derivative of 5 will be 0. The derivative of this integral will just be tangent of x. And if we plug 3 in, this part becomes zero, because we're going from three to three, and then if you add five, it'll have a value of five, so it meets both conditions. So we have a similar one here. We want the derivative to be e to the x tangent of x, so we integrate from eight to x of e to the x tangent, actually these should be t's, should be some sort of different variable, tangent of t dt. Now, if I plug 8 into here, the value of y, y equals, plugging in 8, gives a value of 0, and that's exactly what we want. So we don't really have to add anything. Uh, we could add 0. But if this was, let's say, instead of 0, we wanted the value to be 10, then if I plug 8 in here, this part becomes 0, and I would just have to add 10 to get a value of 10 for y. But as it sits, the answer is that right there. Theorem 4 uh, continued. The fundamental theorem of calculus part 2. If f is continuous at every point of a to b, and if f, capital F, is any antiderivative of f on a to b, then the integral of f of x dx equals the antiderivative evaluated at b minus the antiderivative evaluated at a. And we've used this a lot already. This is nothing new for us. This part of the fundamental theorem is also called the integral evaluation theorem. So we have evaluate an integral. Evaluate negative 1 to 3 of x to the third plus 1 dx using an antiderivative. So we have 1 fourth x to the fourth, that's the antiderivative of x to the third, plus x, and we're evaluating this from negative 1 to 3. So we need to plug 3 in. That's 81 over 4 plus 3, there's 3 plugged in, minus, plug negative 1 in, that's going to be 1 fourth and then minus 1. So we have 81 fourths plus 12 fourths, common denominator, minus 1 fourth, and then if I distribute the negative, we have plus 4 fourths. Let's see, 81 plus 12, that's 93. 93 minus 1 is 92, so it looks like we have 96 fourths. Now does that go in nice? That's 24, so a value of 24. In example six, we're asked to find the total area between the curve y equals four minus x squared and the x-axis on the interval zero to three. Now if we graph this function, we see that the function is above the x-axis from zero to two and below the x-axis from two to three. So if we wanted the net area, because this area will be positive, this area will be negative, then we'd evaluate uh, the integral from zero to three of 4 minus x squared dx. But we don't want net area. We want to add up this area right here, and we want to add up this area here and get a total area. So this problem is slightly different from what we've seen before. Well, positive area is to the left of 2, and negative area is to the right of 2. And you could figure that out without graphing it by setting the function equal to 0. Because 2 is really the 0. So we have 4 minus x squared. We could minus 4, or how about we add x squared? Equals 4. x equals plus or minus 2. So this function does this on the other side, and it has another 0 at negative 2. But we're really not 
looking at that piece. We're only looking from 0 to 3. Let me get rid of all of that. Now the point is, we want to split the integral over the 0. So from 0 to 2 of uh, 4 minus x squared dx. But let's assume that we don't know that this area is actually positive. Let's say we not sure. It could be positive or negative. We want to make sure that we count this as a positive area, which I know already is. But the absolute value would definitely ensure that. And then we're going to add that to the integral from 2 to 3 of 4 minus x squared. And to ensure that we get a positive answer for this, we can take the absolute value also. Now we know it's negative because we looked at the graph, but assuming you don't have the graph, you won't know that this is a negative area until you actually evaluate it. But bottom line is we split the integrals over the zeros and then make sure both of our answers are positive when we're finding total area. Now when we just want area under the curve, we don't have to worry about splitting it over the zeros. So now to do the math part of it, the calculations, the antiderivative is 4x minus 1 third x to the third. And uh, that's for both of these. So we're going to evaluate that from 0 to 2. We're going to add that to 4x minus 1 third x to the third. And we'll evaluate this from 2 to 3. But of course, we're going to make sure that both of these answers are positive. We already know that the first one will be positive and the next one will be negative. But let's pretend we don't get to use a calculator for this so we wouldn't know what the graph looks like. So we have uh, evaluate the top value, so 8 minus, let's see, 2 to the third is 8, so 8 thirds. And then minus, if I plug 0 in both of these, this is just 0. And I have to make sure that this is positive. So we have plus, let's see, plug 3 in, absolute value, 12 minus, let's see, 27 over 3. 3 to the third is 27, that's 9. And then minus, plug the 2 in, we have 8 minus uh, 8 thirds. And we'll make sure this is positive uh, using absolute value. So we have 24 thirds minus 8 thirds. That is 16 thirds. Now that's always already positive, but even if we did do the absolute value, it wouldn't change anything. Uh, so min plus the absolute value of 3 minus, let's see, this is 24 thirds, that's 8 thirds. Uh, so we have 16 thirds again on this side. So that's equal to 16 thirds plus the absolute value of, let's see, 3 is actually 9 thirds. So it's really negative 7 thirds. Now, if we wanted just area under the curve, I wouldn't worry about the absolute value. The answer would be 9 thirds. And uh, so the answer would be 3 if we wanted net area. But since we want total area, it's going to be 16 thirds plus 7 thirds, which is 23 thirds. So net area, when they want net, or uh, total area, when they want total area, we have to split the integrals over uh, the zeros. We've got to split the equation over the zeros. Find the total area of the region between the curve and the x-axis. So here's another example. So the first thing we do is we find out, now we're only going from negative 2 to 2, so let's find out if there are any zeros in between. So we set the function equal to 0, add 3, divide by 3. So x squared equals 1, and there's actually two zeros, plus and minus 1. So this function is a parabola. We could draw a little sketch of it. It has zeros at negative 1 and 1, and we're going from negative 2 to 2. Well, this has a y-intercept of negative 3 and crosses at the ones, so this parabola looks something like this. Well, if we split the integrals over the over the zero, or split the integrals over the zeros, we're going to have positive area, negative area, and then more a little bit more positive area here. So we can set this up like this. We're going to go from negative two to negative one of let's say y, just the function. I'm going to add that to negative 1 to 1. So that's this middle region, and we know that that'll be negative area. And then we're going to add that to 1 to 2 of y dx. So the integral is going to, all, all three of the integrals are going to be the same. Uh, the integral is going to be x to the third minus 3 
x. We're going to evaluate that from negative 2 to negative 1, but we want to do all absolute values to ensure that we do get total area, not net area. So that's going to be plus x to the third minus 3x from negative 1 to 1, and then finally x to the third minus 3x from 1 to 2. So we have negative 1 plus 3. That's plugging negative 1 in. And of course, we want absolute values around all of this. Minus, let's see, plug in negative 2. That'll be negative 8 and then plus 6. Make sure that's positive. Plus, plug 1 in. That's 1 minus 3 minus. Plug a negative 1 in. That's negative 1 plus 3 absolute value. And then finally, on the end here, we have 8 minus 6 minus, plug the 1 in, 1 minus 3. There. Woof. That's a long one. So we have 2 minus negative 2. That's going to be 4. Plus negative 2 minus 2. And finally, on the end here, we have 2 minus negative 2. That's the value. All right, well, we have, that's going to be 4 plus, that would be negative 4. Uh, so it's going to be 4 with the absolute value. And then again, we have 4 on the end, so we end up with an answer of 12. Now, that's the last problem, but let's go back to this example, example six, and I want to show you how you can get all of this if we were able to use a calculator. So uh, let me pause here and I'm going to get the calculator out. So I've got the calculator out. Here it is. And if we want to find the total area of this function from zero to three, what we can do is we can make sure that all of the graph is above the x-axis. And we can do that by putting the absolute values around the function. Now, what happens when you put absolute value around is all of the negative y values become positive. So the graph would do this. So it'd stay positive where it's positive, where it's negative. Whoops, it's not supposed to cross. If we put absolute values around, it should look like this. I'll draw it a little better. The positive y's will stay positive, but then the negative y's become positive as well. So if you're going to do this on a calculator, all you have to do is in Y1, we'll put absolute value, which is under math, arrow over to num, there's your absolute value. And this is 4 minus x squared. Well, I guess uh, I can just show you what this graph looks like. And there it is from 0 to 3, right there. That's the same piece we have here. So we can go to the main, uh, to the home screen, math number nine, there's the integral, and then you go math num, absolute value of four minus x squared, comma, oh, yeah, I want to close the parentheses, comma x, comma zero to three. And we should get, uh, well, let's see what we get. Mm -hmm, thinking, thinking. 7.666, that's 7 and 2 thirds, really. There's a little rounding error with the calculators. So if we go back, this is actually 23 divided by 3 is 7. That's 21 and 2 thirds. So we do get the same answer with the exception of a little bit of a rounding error on the end. So if you want to get total area instead of net area, you can just put the function in absolute value. But if you do it by hand, you're going to have to split the function over the zeros and make sure you count all the area as positive.